Most of us appreciate the beauty of a healthy landscape. We take pride in having a pleasing setting for one of the largest long-term investments of our lifetimes. Plus, creating and maintaining an attractive landscape usually pays off in higher property values. The woody plants that dominate most home landscapes are not without problems. So how do you, the homeowner, manage the problems that affect your woody landscape? We suggest using the IPM or Integrated Pest Management approach to maintaining a gorgeous landscape. IPM is a safe method of using different pest management tools alone or in combination and has been called the common sense approach. The first step to problem solving is to determine what is causing damage to our plants. Is it an insect, disease, weed, or environmental conditions or a combination of these? Once you know, you can decide how to manage the problem. By monitoring plants every so often, you can find and correct problems before they get out of hand. Let's look at several IPM tactics available to us. Cultural control is selecting the right plant for the right site. Select plants suited to your local climate and your landscape's environment. Also, the right plant needs to be installed properly in a landscape. And then, proper care after planting includes watering, fertilization, and pruning. After all, healthy plants are going to be more resistant to pest attack. Biological control uses beneficial organisms such as predators, parasites and disease-causing bacteria, viruses, fungi, or nematodes to control pests. Genetic control uses plants that have been selected or genetically manipulated to become resistant or less susceptible to pests. This is called host plant resistance and is considered by landscape managers as one of the most important tactics available. Mechanical or physical control uses barriers or traps to prevent or reduce pest problems. One example is removing pests by hand. In regulatory control, government agencies can prevent or slow the spread of pests through quarantine, a method of inspecting plants that are transported between states and countries. The same principle of regulatory control applies to all landscape managers as well as homeowners. A good landscape manager will avoid introducing new pests into a landscape by inspecting plants before purchasing and planting. And then there's chemical control. Although this is sometimes the last option considered, chemicals may be the only way to keep a particular pest in check. Remember to always read the label before you purchase and use a pesticide. And when it comes to using pesticides, timing is everything. In this video, we'll look at four parts. Part one will help you to select the right plants for the home landscape. Part two will show the proper techniques for installing woody plants. Part three will discuss routine plant maintenance tips to promote ongoing health. And part four will introduce several important pests of woody landscape plants and describe some of the control mechanisms available. Several factors we will now discuss include plant hardiness, matching plants to a particular site, the natural pest resistance found in certain plants, and the benefits of starting with healthy plants from the garden center. Remember that your landscape is a long-term investment. Wise decisions now will positively impact the health of your landscape for years to come. Plants vary in hardiness according to their genetic makeup. The term hardiness refers to a plant's ability to survive the coldest winter temperatures likely to occur in a given area. The United States Department of Agriculture, or the USDA, has developed a hardiness zone map for North America. You'll notice that Kentucky falls within hardiness zone 6. Plants suited to this zone are able to tolerate winter temperatures down to about minus 10 to 0 degrees Fahrenheit. This is air temperature and not wind chill. Plants rated for a higher USDA hardiness zone, that is seven or above, would likely show some winter damage if planted in Kentucky and might also fail to thrive at all in our climate. Plants rated for a lower USDA zone, say five or below, would survive Kentucky winters and for the most part do just fine here. Most reputable garden centers and nurseries will only stock materials suited for the local environment. However, be careful when ordering plant material from a nursery catalog that might be intended for different hardiness zones. Now that we've selected a plant for our climate, where do we plant it? Your landscape is usually not uniform. There are some sunny versus shady areas, 
areas that tend to stay wet, others that tend to stay dry. When a plant that likes full sun is planted in the shade, the growth tends to be more soft and succulent and vulnerable to diseases. Likewise, when plants that prefer dry conditions are placed in moist soils, they may be prone to root-borne diseases. Wet areas can be low-lying, poorly drained, or areas that collect water runoff from gutter downspouts. If these areas stay wet for extended periods of time between rainfalls, choose plants that will be able to tolerate wet soils. Another important factor in soils is the pH, or the measure of alkalinity or acidity. Most trees and shrubs prefer soils that are neutral to slightly acid, pH 5 to 7. Some exceptions to this are azaleas and rhododendrons, which prefer a more acid soil, pH around 4.5. A few species, such as butterfly bush and viburnums, prefer neutral to slightly alkaline soils. Raising the soil's pH can be easily done by adding lime. Making soils more acid, however, is a little more difficult. Adding sulfur to the soil will temporarily lower the pH, but if the soil is too alkaline, a better practice would be to remove the existing soil to a depth of one and a half to two feet and replace it with a peat-based medium. Next, we have natural plant resistance. This is a plant species' genetic ability to resist or tolerate pests. In some cases, one entire species may be susceptible to a pest while a related species may be resistant. For example, the American chestnut is susceptible to a blight disease while Chinese chestnut is resistant. In other cases, different selections or cultivars within a species may be susceptible or resistant. When you buy plants, pick out the healthiest, most robust plants that have no evidence of disease or insect damage. The potting medium should be moist and the roots should be dispersed and light colored. Avoid buying plants that have roots growing from the drainage holes or circling around the top of the pot. If you buy plants from a mail order catalog, be aware that most woody plants will be shipped dormant and bare root, that is, without any soil. Generally, it's best to buy one-year-old material from catalogs. In summary, part one has shown us the decisions that need to be made when selecting plants for the home landscape. First, we need to know which plants are suited to our area of the country by consulting the USDA Hardiness Zone Map. Second, we need to select plants that will grow well in the sites that they are to be planted in. Third, we need to be aware that certain plants or cultivars may be naturally resistant to certain pests and diseases. And finally, we need to be careful when we select plants from a nursery or garden center. Remember the old saying, out of sight, out of mind? This can be the case when looking at trees and shrubs. Half of these plants are located below the surface, but when it comes to plant problems, this is where over half of them begin. Soil quality is one of the most important factors in determining plant health and vigor. Improperly planted trees and shrubs and those installed in poor soils are more vulnerable to insects, diseases, and other life-threatening problems. When we think of soil, we think of it as solid and non-living. Both of these perceptions are false. Soil is approximately half solid material and half pore space. The pore space is important for holding water and air for the plant's use. Without soil oxygen, plant roots can't take up water and nutrients. Sometimes as a result of traffic, soil particles are pressed together eliminating small pores. Existing plants decline when soils compact and new plantings fail to thrive. If you must plant in a compacted or clay soil, it is very important to dig a large hole. The more difficult it is to dig a planting hole, the more important it is to dig it big. Plants in good soil should have a hole that is at least twice as wide as the soil ball. In compacted or heavy clay soils, the hole should be three times the diameter of the soil ball. Wider is even better. While you can't have a planting hole too wide, you can dig it too deep or shallow. A perfect planting hole is exactly the same depth as the soil ball. It is more harmful for the plant to be an inch too deep than an inch too shallow. Most plants will not thrive in flooded soils. Oxygen is pushed out when water fills pore spaces. Without oxygen, plants are unable to take up water and nutrients and diseases will surely attack the roots. If you suspect that your soil is poorly drained, it's better to know this before planting than after when problems have already developed. To test soil drainage, fill the hole with water. If water is still in the hole 24 hours later, 
A change of plans is in order before planning. You could try digging a wider hole, draining water to another spot, and using raised mounds. The mounds work better for shrubs than for trees because of the far-ranging root system on large trees. Or select a water-tolerant plant for the site. Don't add sand, peat moss, compost, or other material to the backfill. While it seems like these amendments should improve drainage, really they do just the opposite. When you add these to a poorly drained soil, it actually stays wet longer. Amended soils essentially act like a sponge in a bucket. So even on compacted or heavy clay soils, it's better to dig a wider hole and backfill with the same soil that came out of the planting hole. Before you put a plant in its new home, inspect the root system. Plants grown in containers often have roots that circle around. These should be cut in two or three locations prior to planting or loosened and spread out in the planting hole. With bare root plants, it's especially important that roots are spaced out in the planting hole with loose soil worked in. Broken and crushed roots should be trimmed back. Before rapid growth can occur, roots that were cut or damaged while transplanting must be regenerated. At first, adding fertilizer, especially nitrogen, is not good because it stimulates faster shoot growth above ground than the roots can support. For the first year or two, watering is much more important than fertilization. Water thoroughly once or twice per week during the growing season. Fertilizer can be applied in late fall after the plant has been in the ground for one year. Mulching benefits plants in many ways. It reduces competition from weeds, moderates soil temperatures, keeping it warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer, reduces runoff of water allowing more time for water to soak into the soil, and reduces soil moisture loss by evaporation. And one of the most important features of all, mulch makes landscapes look nice and uniform. Like so many other things, mulch can be overdone or done improperly. Two to three inches of mulch is plenty. Mulch should never be piled against the trunk. It should extend a minimum of 18 inches from the base of the plant with an additional foot for every inch of trunk caliper. All mulch is not the same. Later we'll see how the quality of mulch can also affect landscape plants. All plants need some degree of maintenance to stay healthy. Watering, fertilizing, pruning, and mulching are necessary if plants are to look their best. Properly maintained plants are like our own bodies. A strong immune system can fight off insect and disease attacks that would otherwise mean death. Most trees and shrubs recommended for Kentucky will do well if they receive one inch of water every seven to 10 days, especially during periods of dry weather. In contrast, a newly transplanted tree needs water every seven days for the first three years. At each watering, apply at least one inch to the area under the drip line of the tree's foliage. If applied by a sprinkler, set an open-faced can in the area to measure one inch of water accumulation. If a soaker hose or other type of drip irrigation is being used, check the top six inches or so of soil for wetness. One inch of irrigation will usually soak the soil about six inches down. Late fall is the best time to apply fertilizer to trees and shrubs. Most will only require nitrogen. If the tree is growing in an area where turf is regularly fertilized, little or no additional fertilizer is needed. A rule of thumb is to apply two to three pounds of nitrogen for every 1,000 square feet of root area. That's not two to three pounds of fertilizer, it's two to three pounds of nitrogen. For example, the analysis for ammonium nitrate is 3400. The first number represents the percentage of nitrogen. So ammonium nitrate is 34% nitrogen. For two to three pounds, apply six to nine pounds of ammonium nitrate. This can be split into two or three applications. Spread some in late October, some in November, and the remainder in December. To calculate the tree's root area, first consider that most woody plants will have a root area that extends two to three times the diameter of the canopy or the limbs. Measure from the trunk to the outer edge of the canopy, then multiply by two to get the effective radius of the root area. Then plug this number into the formula for the area of a circle. So how much fertilizer should be applied in our example? We divide 314 square feet by 1,000 square feet and multiply this by two to three pounds nitrogen. The result would be 0.6 to 0.9 pounds of nitrogen or 1.8 to 2.7 pounds of ammonium nitrate. This should be spread over the entire effective root zone. 
Pruning needs to be done every year. And when you do it regularly, there's usually only small branches that need to be removed, which most homeowners can do. However, when trees have been neglected for several years, major pruning cuts may be necessary to correct the plant's growth. Very large, mature trees sometimes have special pruning needs. In these cases, the homeowner should consider consulting a professional arborist for assistance. Newly planted trees usually don't need much pruning. Prune newly planted trees only to remove problem branches and to shape the tree to a form typical of that species. Do not remove the central leader or central stem. Do not remove tips of branches unless they are growing into the tree's interior and becoming crowded. Remove the less dominant branch if two branches are growing at a tight angle. If left unchecked, the result will be inclusions of bark at the intersection of the two branches. This area will become a problem site for rotting, insects, and wind damage. The goal during this period of growth is to establish well-formed and well-spaced scaffold or main branches that will become the network to limbs once the tree matures. Establish branches that are well-spaced vertically 18 to 24 inches apart. These branches should meet the trunk with a fairly broad angle, 60 to 90 degrees is ideal, and should be evenly distributed radially to prevent higher branches from shading lower ones. Do not cut back the central leader in trees where it forms the trunk. Examples include conical or pyramidal trees such as tulip tree, black gum, sweet gum, pin oak, shingle oak, and aristocrat calorie pear. The central leader of oval or round shaped trees can be cut back lightly to a lateral twig or bud to encourage additional lateral branching. This is called a modified central leader and is used to shape a maple, ash, honey locust, linden, dogwood, crab apples, and some others. Remove one of the two branches forming a tight fork to prevent weak bark inclusions. Remove or cut back any dominant side branches. If cutting back, cut at an outfacing bud or side branch to encourage outward growth. Remove branches that may develop into potential hazards. Low hanging branches are those that encroach upon utility lines or buildings. The requirements for pruning large trees are basically the same as those for younger ones. The only difference is the scale. Working in large trees can be dangerous, and a single pruning cut may remove an entire scaffold limb with major impacts to the appearance and health of the tree. When pruning large trees, it is wise to obtain the services of a competent professional arborist. Pruning in large trees cannot replace proper plant selection and planting under power lines. The placement of large shade trees under power lines is a mistake. Such trees should be removed and replaced with a more suitable small growing tree. Never try to remove trees or tree limbs that are growing in or near power lines. Call the utility company or professional arborist. Never top trees. False assumption is that topping trees or dehorning limbs by severely cutting them back to the main scaffold branch is a rejuvenation process. This process is not healthy to the tree and it is not recommended. The shape of the tree will be altered forever and the new growth that results will be crowded and will grow rapidly, inviting insect and disease problems. Remove dead, dying, or diseased twigs and branches. This should be done at any time during the year. In mature trees, the timely removal of such branches may prevent or halt the spread of disease to major scaffold limbs. Remove branches that cross or rub against one another. This contact between branches causes open wounds and that enables disease and insects to enter. Remove rapidly growing water sprouts that form vertical shoots on the trunk or inside the canopy of the tree. These shoots seldom flower or fruit and will alter the shape of the tree. These rapidly growing shoots are also more susceptible to pests. Shrubs usually need pruning every few years. Depending on the type of pruning, the result may be to either thin out the growth or to make the plant more bushy. Proper pruning will also promote more flowering. The time of year for pruning depends on the flower habit of the plant. In some cases, shrubs become too woody and may exhibit decreased bloom. In this case, Renewal pruning is practiced where one-third of the oldest stems are cut off low to the ground. The new growth will produce the desired blooms. The next year another one-third of the older stems are removed and the remainder of the older stems removed the following year. These types of cuts tend to open up the shrub for better light penetration and air movement. If all the old stems were removed at once, it would be difficult to control the vigor of the new growth. For some shrubs, a more branching habit is desired. So a pruning cut into recent year's growth called heading back will promote branching from buds near the cut. 
For shrubs where the canopy may be lopsided or have sparsely branched areas, heading back cuts may be the answer to promote branching and fill in the holes. Shearing is a pruning method often used on shrubs to provide a very formal appearance. Shearing removes only the tips of branches and promotes high foliage density at the end of the branch. This can be an unhealthy situation for the plant because sunlight and air do not penetrate into the plant's canopy. Shearing can also make plants, especially evergreens, more susceptible to spider mites and aphids. However, if you do shear, make the top of the shrub a little more narrow than the base. This will allow the base of the shrub to receive sunlight and reduce dieback of foliage. Every few years, shear into old wood to invigorate the plant and encourage new branches. In all cases, collect the trimmings and dispose or compost them. If left in the foliage, these dying branches may serve as a host to diseases and insects. Most experts agree that late winter to early spring is the best time to prune most woody plants. Fall is the least desirable time. Pruning should not be done when plants are first breaking bud and forming new leaves in the spring. Woody plants that flower before June 1 should be pruned just after flowering. Woody plants that flower after June 1st should be pruned in late winter or early spring. Using proper tools is a must when pruning. Hand pruners will work on limbs up to a half inch thick. Limb loppers can be used on branches up to one and a half inches thick, while telescoping pole pruners are used to reach limbs up to 30 feet high. When pruning smaller limbs, make sure it's cut flush with the branch it is attached to. Leave only the branch collar or swollen section of bark at the base to help the branch heal. Use a handsaw for larger limbs and use the three-point cutting method to remove it. First, make an undercut about a foot from the trunk and about one quarter of the way through the limb. This keeps the bark from ripping when the limb falls. Make the second cut all the way through on the top of the limb about two inches out from the first cut. The last cut removes the stub to just outside the bark collar where it's attached to the trunk. Mulches are categorized into two basic groups, organic and inorganic. Organic mulches include bark, wood chips, leaves, grass clippings, pine needles, compost, and newspaper. Organics decompose over time and become incorporated into the soil. This means that we need to apply more mulch periodically depending on what type of mulch we're using. Good mulch should have an earthy smell. Beware of sour mulch that has begun decomposition without sufficient oxygen present. It'll smell much like vinegar and will burn plants. If it's sour, offload it to an out-of-the-way location. Use a shovel or pitchfork to unload and mix organic mulch to allow oxygen to promote decomposition. After a few days, stick your arm into the pile. If you feel hot areas, turn the mulch again and let it set for another week to 10 days. Afterwards, you may have to turn the pile again, let it set until the inner area cools and the pile has an earthy smell. Watering freshly applied mulch promotes the growth of beneficial organisms and reduces the growth of nuisance fungi. Inorganic mulches include gravel, plastic, landscape fabrics, and rubber pellets made from recycled tires. They are relatively inert, so they do not break down over time. In general, organic mulches are superior to inorganic ones. It's best to put down about two to three inches of mulch. If there's more than four inches, the tree or shrub roots can suffocate and the deep layer attracts rodents. Proper maintenance of trees and shrubs encourages healthy growth that makes the plants less susceptible to attack by insects and disease. There are two types of borers found in landscape trees, clear wing and flathead or metallic beetles. Clear wing borers are small, day-flying moths that resemble wasps. The adults are rarely seen, but it's the caterpillar or larval stage that causes all the damage. Female moths lay eggs on the trunks and lower branches of trees, often using lawnmower and string trimmer wounds as entry sites. Upon hatching, larvae will bore into the tree and mostly feed in the cambial or bright green area just under the bark. Symptoms of borer infestation include chunks of bark flaking off the tree with dead areas underneath. Sawdust like frass can sometimes be seen in the cracks of the bark. Feeding galleries packed with frass in the cambial area are often visible. Clear wing borers feed on dogwood, lilac, ash, cherry, and peach trees. The second type of borer is the flat-headed or metallic wood boring beetle. 
These beetles are often bullet-shaped with a flattened head, tapered wing covers, and short legs and antennae. As the name suggests, many of these have a metallic sheen to the body. Like the clear wing borers, the larval stage is the one that causes all the damage by boring mostly into the cambium. The legless larvae tend to be long and flat with a head that is wider than the body. The metallic wood boring beetles feed on birch, maple, oak, hickory, sycamore, tulip tree, willow, rose, and cotoneaster trees. Infestations by either of these borers stress plants and may girdle them to death. To manage borers, plant resistant cultivars that are adapted to the local climate. Planting in the proper location and careful maintenance will also help prevent borer problems. Timely sprays of residual insecticides on the trunk and lower branches will prevent infestations. Professional arborists may inject systemic insecticides in certain situations. The Japanese beetle becomes less of a problem a few years after it invades a region. However, there are still concerns about defoliation caused by this introduced pest. Not only is the adult beetle a serious pest on a great variety of plants, but the grubs are a serious turf pest as well, feeding on the roots of grasses. The adult beetles feed on over 300 species of plants, including lindens, crab apples, maples, birches, cherries, plums, peaches, elms, and grapes. Management of the Japanese beetle includes using plants that are less attracted to them, a number of insecticides are labeled for use against the adults and grubs. Scale insects feed on plants by puncturing plant tissues with their mouthparts and withdrawing sap, similar to using a hypodermic needle. Scales can be serious pests on many plants and may be difficult to detect because of their small size, shape, and coloration. Most young scale insects are active and are called crawlers, but later stages settle down in a single spot on the host plant. A hand lens is useful when looking for these tiny crawlers. There are two basic groups of pest scales. Armored scales that produce a shell-like covering over them and soft scales that have a leathery type covering and often produce honeydew. Honeydew is the sticky, sweet excrement from these scales that messes up foliage and anything under the tree and results in sooty mold growth. Scales can infest evergreens, euonymus, tulip tree, magnolias, maples, oaks, and several others. We can manage scale insects with horticultural oils either during late winter or during the summer. We can also use systemic insecticides that are absorbed by the plant and kill the insects when they feed. Or contacts that are mostly restricted to crawler control and therefore must be applied when crawlers are present. Mites, often called spider mites because they are closely related to spiders and have eight legs, can be very serious pests of several plants. Mites are tiny and many are about the size of a period. Mite infestations cause spots on the foliage ranging from small specks to large areas and have a pale, sickly appearance. The leaves will gradually die and drop. Checking the undersides of leaves with a hand lens or tapping foliage on a light-colored sheet of paper will reveal mites if they are the cause. Plants that are prone to mite infestations are spruces, other evergreens, euonymus, roses, boxwoods, hollies, azaleas, rhododendrons, maple, elm, and redbud. Management of mites can be done with horticultural oils or with conventional miticides. Now let's examine a few specific diseases of trees in the landscape. First, look for trees in trouble, then diagnose the problem or have it diagnosed by a professional. Often this includes integrating several different kinds of disease management practices and in some cases it might be best to remove the disease tree and start over with a disease resistant type. Powdery mildew fungus is not hard to spot on the leaves of many trees and shrubs. The fungus is a white, powdery growth on the leaf surface. Powdery mildew is often seen on oaks, sycamores, lilacs, crab apples, dogwoods, and even many garden flowers. The kind of mildew found on each species of plant is different, so there is no danger of spreading a disease from one plant to another plant of a different species. On most plants, it occurs late in the season and does so little damage that special management action is usually not needed. However, in some circumstances, valuable dogwoods may need fungicide applications throughout the summer. Since mildew likes humid conditions, our job is to lower the humidity by increasing sunlight penetration with pruning and increase air movement between plants with good spacing. The apple scab disease fungus can cause defoliation of flowering crab apples. Leaves are infected in early spring, causing olive green spots which turn dark brown with age. Infected leaves turn yellow and drop from the tree, often causing defoliation by midsummer. 
Infected fruits may be gnarled and misshaped. Pyracantha fruits infected with another scab fungus turn black. Scab is especially serious during rainy seasons. Scab-resistant cultivars of flowering crab apple are available. For valuable, susceptible crab apples, fungicide sprays applied bi-weekly from bud break to two weeks after petal fall will reduce disease. The most common pine species grown in Kentucky are white, Scots, and Austrian pine. Each of these grow well at first, but after a few years they begin to decline and die. White pines often die from either white pine decline or white pine root decline. White pine decline occurs when grown in clay soils, compacted soils, or soils with a high pH. However, white pine root decline results from a decay of the roots and lower trunk of the tree by a fungus. This root decline fungus can even attack pines growing on good sites, though it is often more severe in poorly drained sites. Both diseases cause the foliage to fade and then turn brown. Austrian pine suffers from tip blight disease, which begins on the lower branches and works its way up the tree over a period of years. Scots pine are also susceptible to tip blight. However, pine wilt disease caused by the pine wood nematode kills more Scots pine. The nematode, which is spread from diseased to healthy trees by long-horned beetles, infects the resin canals. Austrian and Scots pines should be avoided in most landscapes, and white pines should be grown only in favorable sites with acid, sandy soil. Root and trunk rot diseases of trees can be an unseen hazard affecting mature trees in the landscape. Decayed trees are an accident waiting to happen. Because the decays are hidden, it is often difficult to tell if there's a problem. In such cases, signs of the fungus causing the decay may be diagnosed. For example, when shelf fungi such as Ganoderma appear on the buttress roots of a tree, we know that decay inside the tree is fairly extensive. This can be a signal that the tree needs a professional examination to determine the extent of decay and the risks involved with keeping it. We do know that decay fungi enter trees through wounds or by improper pruning when the tree may have been much younger. Other decay fungi, such as armillaria, invade the tree when the tree is growing under stressful conditions such as drought. Therefore, the best defense against tree stress is to provide good growing conditions. There are three cedar rust diseases common to Kentucky. They are caused by fungi that spend part of their lives on juniper, often referred to as cedar, and part of their lives on alternate hosts such as apple, crabapple, and hawthorn. Where cedars are absent, there is no rust disease. In the absence of apples, crabapples, and hawthorns as alternate hosts, rust will not occur. The cedar apple rust fungus causes orange-colored leaf spots and defoliation of crabapple, apple, and occasionally hawthorn. On cedar and juniper, rust infestations result in brown, spherical galls an inch or so in diameter and sometimes twig dieback. In springtime, galls become bright orange with spore horns of the fungus. Cedar hawthorn rust infects mainly hawthorns but also crab apples and other hosts. Cedar quince rust is the most damaging and it affects many hosts including hawthorn, crab apple, and apple. Cedar quince rust normally does not cause leaf spots, but twig and fruit infections are common. Infected hawthorn and crabapple twigs and thorns become swollen, cankered, and die. Infected fruits are enlarged with white tubular protrusions bearing spores of the rust fungus emerging from them. On cedars, this rust forms perennial spindle-shaped swellings on the twigs upon which a gelatinous orange mass of spores is born in the spring. To manage rust diseases, use rust-resistant apples, crab apples, hawthorns, and junipers. When practical, prune out and destroy rust galls found on ornamental cedars and junipers. So as you can see, integrated pest management in the home landscape may involve several pest management techniques. The basis for pest management is to continually monitor the landscape for pest problems. Then, at the right time, using the right tools, we can treat the problem. In some cases, altering cultural practices may be enough to control the problem. In other cases, a more aggressive strategy that involves biological or chemical control may be necessary. All in all, practicing integrated pest management will allow you to solve the problem in a way that's safest for you and the environment.